We're going to talk about respiration. And we can come to these interrelated systems. We're going to talk about excretory systems. We're also going to talk about interstitial fluid, or fluid in between tissues. And what brings all this together? And that is the possibility that you get an equilibrium between all these systems. That's how they're integrated. There's also a lymph system in here, too, that we'll talk about. I'll just put that in. Okay? So what, what, what dictates the fact that these systems can all talk to each other? And that is capillary. I know this is a drawing upon your ancient memory of about six lectures ago. But if I said to you a capillary is simple squamous, everybody remember that? I'm drawing your memories? What can you say about simple squamous? Leaky. It's leaky, exactly right. Capillaries are designed to be leaky. And the reason is all the places that I drew these equilibrium arrows, arrows are capillary intersections between these systems, which are critical in all these systems basically talking to each other. So here's our capillary. And they're quite, there's equilibrium. They have equilibrium of circulation with interstitial fluid. There's uh, capillaries in the lung between the kidneys. We'll talk about them between the digestive system and the circulatory system, okay? So if you understand that capillaries control the communication between these systems, you have a good understanding of how these systems interface with each other. Okay? So, we're going to start with digestion. And I'd like to start out with what's nice, what's interesting about aspects of this is the interface between science, business, and politics. It's always kind of fun to think about. So in the case of digestion, um, it was found that adipocytes, or fat cells, produce a hormone-like molecule called leptin, which binds to leptin uh, uh, neurons, leptin activated neurons, I should say. And what this causes is, is a loss of appetite and an increase in activity. And so you say, so why is this important from a human point of view? Well, particularly in the, us in the Western cultures, we're, as a population, way overweight. And if we can take a magic pill and all of a sudden have less appetite and more activity, guess what? We lose weight without even trying. And so the theory was they tried it into a mouse. They took a mouse. They're called, they're obese, 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 obese. So they're not, they have a, de a defective mutation in there. They gave these mice nothing. And after a certain time frame, they became normal size. So it worked wonderfully in mice. You take these fat, obese mice, hit them with leptin, and they become normal. So one company bought the patent for this for about a half a billion dollars. They tried it in humans, and guess what? It didn't work very well. The reason being is the appetite sensing and activity systems are much more complicated than simply one class of neurons that is activated by leptin. They found out it's a little more complicated. So they found out a lot about science, but because of the desire in our population to take overeating, overweight, under-exercised people and turn them into normal-looking, not normal-looking, but slimmer, uh, you know, uh, more healthy-looking people, um, they found out it won't work. What works in mice, in this case, though not necessarily work in humans. So the point is there's a lot of attention being played to issues of digestion and uh, nutrient uptake and so forth because of these kinds of reasons, and this is an outgrowth of that. Okay? So why are we hungry? Why do we eat? You've got to get chemical energy. You've got to get carbon backbones, nitrogen, essential vitamins, amino acids, minerals, et cetera, et cetera. And when you process the food, it's actually a multi-step process. So when you process food, you have ingestion, which we're not going to talk too much about. You have digestion. And another way of saying digestion is hydrolysis of larger molecules and smaller molecules. And another way of saying that is putting water across a covalent bond. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And then there's absorption, which we'll talk a little bit about. And that's bringing in nutrients, actually nutrients and water. You bring it in, and something we won't talk much about is elimination. Okay, so these are the four main areas in general piece of chalk. So, the generic digestive system is called the an elementary canal. Okay, yes, yes, Kristen. Uh, no, it's, it, it, uh, it's a more higher level, it's related to glucose glucagon. It's a higher level uh, regulation. You still need glucose. Okay, you still need to use that. But this changes your, how much appetite you might have. So if you don't have much appetite, you still have your glucose regulation going on. It depends on how much you eat. It will depend on how much you take in. Okay? Yes, yeah, but that, that's not necessarily related to your glucose uptake regulatory mechanism. That's a higher level ordered brain function, basically, that's going on. This definitely activates neurons, is what this does. Okay? All right. So your, your, your generic elementary canal is basically, food comes in one compartment. You have hydrolysis, perhaps. And it goes to a sphincter, which is a ring-like valve. We have three of those. And then it goes into another compartment, maybe for hydrolysis and some absorption. And you have elimination. But what feeds into both of these various compartments are various glands and organs. It provides material, pH, lowers pH like in your stomach, uh, provides enzymes for, for hydrolysis and so forth. So your generic elementary canal is you've got these compartments separated by valves, basically a plumbing system, and you bring into it various other enzymes and uh, create an environment for hydrolysis. And the thing is, you're taking these big pieces of food and you want to break it down into little pieces so you can then use it and we, uh, reconstruct whatever you want to reconstruct in the cells. So you can't take a protein. And use it. You gotta break it down into amino acids and reform your own proteins. This all goes on on different compartments in the elementary canal. Okay? So let's use this board as our elementary canal. And for now, these metal things right here are gonna be our sphincters, our ring like valves. And the first part of this, when the food comes in, so here's the food, okay? Comes into the mouth. What you have in here is the salivary gland, which is very important in the beginnings of hydrolysis. And I'll put, and I'll put this, I'll do the salivary gland down here. So the salivary gland. So there's a bunch of stuff, but two of the ones that are fairly important is production of a secretion of an enzyme called amylase. And amylase converts polysaccharides, or, or very complex sugars, 
into a more, uh, say, simpler structures, mono and disaccharides. In addition, you have mucin, which provides uh, a, lubri a buffer and also lubricates. So right away, I'll put this uh, board back down here in a second. Okay. And what you get out of this is something called a food bolus. And this food bolus, um, that's a little bit chewed up, obviously, from your, the mechanism of your teeth and from the use of the amylase, which breaks down the polysaccharides, goes in the pharynx, which you're not going to worry about exactly what it does, and the esophagus. Basically, it sends the food bolus towards the stomach. Okay, so you've already started some hydrolysis through the salivary glands, amylase. Then it goes to a sphincter. Again, these are the sphincters. And we go into the stomach. And the stomach is important in that it provides another enzyme called pepsin, which is a protease, a very nonspecific protease, which cleaves proteins into a smaller peptides and amino acids. There's a, there's a mechanism here I'll talk about in a second. And provides acid. And so the environment is in the stomach of uh, protease that you can imagine has a pH. What do you think the pH optimum of pepsin is? Very low, right? pH 3, somewhere around there. So it doesn't work very well at neutral pH. It only works on acid, at acid pH. And what happens is there's the, pr the production of pepsin goes to a mechanism that's kind of fundamentally similar to other mechanisms. In that, you have cells on the wall of the stomach called chief cells. And this secretes into this a precursor called pepsinogen. I'll put this board down in a second. Pepsinogen, here's, here's the protein. It's a precursor, and it's, it's mostly inactive, and it's larger. Pepsinogen then gets converted into pepsin. So the, the C terminal comes off. And this is now smaller and active. And what, what, what enhances this process is the sodium chloride, I mean the um, hydrogen chloride, I mean part of the, the acid, which comes from another kind of cell on the stomach wall called the parietal cells. So what happens is, in the fundamental mechanism is you've got a larger inactive molecule. And I'll use a piece of two, two uh, now the erasers are not, are not receptors, but they're proteins, enzymes. So here's pepsinogen, it's inactive and larger. Everybody see that? So a little bit of acid, you get a little bit of activity, some pepsin is formed, you start re are redoing it, pepsin gets active, it chews up the pepsinogen, and it cleaves off this, the end. This smaller molecule is pepsin. It is now much, is very active. And you'll see this a lot in biology, where larger molecules are inactive, or very, either inactive or very lightly active, versus a highly active smaller molecule. And you'll see this uh, probably in a few minutes, well, and again. OK, you're going to see that. Yeah, so C terminal comes off. Don't worry about that. Larger, inactive, smaller, active. Many examples of hormones do the same thing. So this, so the chief cells actually secrete pepsinogen, and then pepsin gets formed, which is the active protease. And what comes out of the stomach is something called the acid chyme. OK? Then goes through another sphincter on the other side of the stomach. Because of the acid in the stomach, you have sphincters on both ends to keep the acid in there, to keep it um, enclosed in the stomach itself. And it now hits the small intestine, where a lot of, a lot of hydrolysis takes place. So this is the duodenum of the small intestine. And what happens is, I'll move this word up here in a second, you dump into this a variety of enzymes from the pancreas. The pancreas dumps in, dumps in uh, sodium bicarbonate, which is there to neutralize the acid, right? The bicarbonate is base, neutralizes the acid. But in addition, the pancreas puts out a bunch of enzymes I call the exases. I'll tell you why I say that in a second. I'll do it right now. This is my term, exases. You'll not see that in any textbooks. I'll help you understand what's going on. When you see the term ASE, ACE, that means cleavage. To me, that means, in this case, hydrolysis, breaking down large molecules into small molecules. The pancreas pumps out a bunch of enzymes whose role is to break down other molecules. So it puts out proteases. And a good example here is it puts out a protease called trypsin, trypsin but it actually makes pepsinogen, which is a larger precursor, inactive, larger precursor. Just like pepsinogen, larger and active, trypsinogen, larger and active, and it makes trypsin, which is the active protease. Okay, and it pumps out a bunch of others. That's the only one you need to know about. I'll put this board down in a second. It also makes amylase, very similar enzyme to what comes out in the uh, salivary gland. Uh, I'll put the other one over here. Also puts out nucleases. Nope, all the enzymes here in the ASE. Nucleates takes DNA and RNA, puts it down to sugars, phosphate groups, and bases. Total hydrolysis. And we're missing one here, lipases, which takes fats into fatty acids and glycerol. So what it does is, these exases that I call them, it's just a way to remember, you put out proteases, lipases, nucleases, and uh, this one, amylases. Okay? Break down of proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and fats. That's everything you eat. Okay? That's breakdownable. That's undergo hydrolysis. So the pancreas pops out all these exases uh, to start this uh, hydrolysis. What you have here is hydrolysis. In addition, you also produce bile from the gallbladder, which is actually produced, is stored there, which comes from the liver. Okay? So the other thing you produce is bile from the liver store in the gallbladder. What bile does, it solubilizes the fats so that you can digest them or convert them to hydrolysis. Now, say you're in a, you got your doctor, you got guys going on to medicine, and you see a patient that's had their gallbladder removed. If you remove your gallbladder, what can't you secrete into the alimentary canal? Bile, right? So what would be your recommendation dietarily? Low yeah, low-fat diet. So patients that have their gallbladders removed um, have to go a low-fat, really low-fat diet because they cannot handle the fats. The bile helps solubilize it, therefore helps you um, digest it. So if you can't digest it, it comes up the worst, so to speak. And it's good to have a low-fat diet. It's always good to have a somewhat low-fat diet anyway. Once you, once you become, uh, you know, your age or older. Yeah, you can also make it, but fat-soluble vitamins was the question, but you take so little of them, it doesn't matter. We're talking about eating 
you know, a nice, you know, a greasy hamburger, for example, things like that. Probably should cut that out if you have a gallbladder removed, but you can't handle it from a, from a hydrolysis point of view. So let's, let's think about it up to this point. You eat. Your salivary gland pumps out amylase. You start the hydrolysis process. You then goes into the stomach. The combination of the acid and pepsin starts breaking down proteins. Uh, the acid causes major conformational changes. You then, and there's a mechanism where you have pepsinogen forming the pepsin. You go from an inactive precursor to an active molecule. It goes to another sphincter. You go into the duodenum, and you pump out the exasis to really break down the rest of the stuff. And we'll get to the rest of that in a second. Okay, question? Yes, they have really fatty stools. Exactly what goes on. And, huh? You don't. You, you have them eat less fat. That's the point. That, that you can't solubilize it, therefore you can't hydrolyze it. Therefore, you're, it's not as good for you. So you can't deal with it physiologically. So what I'm just saying is you'll see where the diet plays a role in how you the system, um, how you can use these enzymes. Okay. All right. Other questions. Protein yes, protein hydrolysis, trypsin, is a very promiscuous protease. It likes everything. Okay, and it takes out, uh, generally speaking, takes uh, proteins down to amino acids and peptides. And we will pick up on Monday, after you guys eat your wonderful meals over the weekend, we will pick up on the uh, rest of the uh, little bit of the remaining of the digestive system.